So just to get a little bit of context with this, we have discussed this uh, kind of event briefly, briefly um, in our video on what if Germany never unified, right? Or well, at the very least, we kind of set the stage for it. So where we'd left off with that video was talking about the Franco-Prussian War, in which, you know, Bismarck uh, leading Prussia end up, you know, provoking uh, the French Emperor Napoleon III, and Napoleon III went to war with Prussia, this ended up uh, sparking the unification of the different German states because they were scared that France would take them over, as had happened under Napoleon. And as a result, they basically banded together and, you know, they basically destroyed the French army. Now, we mentioned that, like, you know, Napoleon III had been captured by the Prussians. What we didn't really talk about, we kind of, I think, maybe mentioned it, um, was that this led to the overthrow of Napoleon III because politicians in France were basically fed up with, with Napoleon III. He'd already taken France into the Crimean War of the 1850s, and he also like basically got them in a whole bunch of foreign policy blunders, uh, all for his own personal kind of gain and his own personal glory. So with this defeat at the hands of the Germans, this was basically the final nail in the coffin, and so the politicians in France declared the Third Republic, right? And this was the last time that France would ever have monarchy. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's basically what ended up being declared. However, not everyone was uh, as excited about this as you might expect, because you had uh, a certain group of uh, uh, soldiers known as the Garde Nationale. Uh, so this is you know, the National Guard. And these soldiers here were basically defenders of the city of uh, Paris. And they came predominantly from a uh, working class background and stuff. So they're very kind of, you know, like relatively poor people and stuff. And what they basically said is, right, if you're going to declare this new like French Republic, we don't want it to be the same as when we had a monarchy, right? We want to have rights. We want to have the right to vote. Uh, we want to have, you know, better living conditions. We want basically a home fit for heroes, yeah, as like the saying would go in Britain after like, World War One, right? So it's that idea of, you know, we, you know, we've thought we've sacrificed for these things. We want some things in return. However, much to the disappointment of the uh, Guard National, uh, in February of 1871, there ended up being a parliamentary election in which 62% of people voted for pro-peace monarchist parties. Now, this is quite strange, especially given the fact that, you know, just the year before, there had been a referendum on this new constitutional republic in which 83% of people had voted for it. So it seems quite strange that the monarchists end up, you know, winning that election, even in spite of you know, basically losing that referendum. However, something to note is obviously because of the war going on, many people in France wanted peace. And, you know, the Republicans, they tended to be more militaristic. They tended to be the ones who wanted to continue the war with uh, Germany, whereas the monarchists could kind of see the right on the wall. They could see that they'd been defeated in the field and that there was no hope of victory. So it's better, no matter what the cost is, it's better to just, you know, uh, accept defeat and just pay the terms of it. And the terms were quite steep, I should note this. So first of all, they obviously uh, would lose Alsace and Lorraine, which they wouldn't win back again until after World War I. On top of that, they had uh, a war debt, which they had to pay to Prussia, which equated to about a quarter of uh, the French economy. And then on top of that, to add insult to injury, the Prussian troops would march, and they basically do a victory parade through the streets of Paris, and something to note also is that Paris was besieged during this time. You know, so you wouldn't see a, a, a kind of siege like this until the time of World War II, where it's really, you know, completely surrounded and, you know, you're getting shelled on like a routine basis. And, you know, people are getting so desperate that like they resort to eating horses. And then when their horses run out, they then resort to eating rats, right? So this is a major, like, violation, basically. Personally, I wouldn't have it. Um, but... The point being is that people of Paris were like, hold on, we fought this war, we've had to undergo like this terrible siege, and now you are going to allow these Prussian troops to do a victory parade down Paris, right? No, we're not accepting this. And on top of this, the government decided that they were going to, you know, uh, disband uh, the, the Garde Nationale, and they were going to, in the dead of night, they were going to sneak in, take their cannons, and then, you know, that, that, that would be the end of them. However, they forgot to bring horses to take these cannons away. And by the time the people of Paris woke up, they were infuriated by this shift. You know, because what you have to understand is that these cannons were used in the defence of Paris from the Germans. And, you know, to take these cannons away, which had become very symbolic things, you know, to the people of Paris, was a real, real insult. 
And so this is what led to the uprising and what basically led to the uh, Paris Commune of 1871. So now with the new Republican government and the army having to flee to, you know, the Palace of Versailles, yeah, and that was the new seat of government, what did the revolutionaries basically want? Well, this is the kind of problem, right? It's very reminiscent of the Spanish Civil War in which, you know, you basically have like, all these different competing factions and rather than uniting against the common threat, which is the kind of reactionary force, instead you end up fighting amongst yourselves, right? So within the Paris Commune, as, you, as would happen with the uh, Spanish Civil War, you had, you know, uh, a communist, uh, you also had uh, anarchists, you had socialists, you had all these different groups who were all fighting with each other and couldn't really agree on things, you know, other than just like the very, very basics, right? So for instance, they wanted the separation of church and state, they wanted the abolition of uh, uh, child labour. They wanted the remission of rents uh, which were owed during the siege because obviously, you know, during the siege, people aren't able to go to work as they normally would. So it's a little bit cheeky landlords demanding like months and months worth of rent, which people weren't able to kind of pay back. On top of that, there was a cancellation of any uh, uh, interest on like the debts that were owed. And on top of that, uh, you know, you had uh, uh, the workers uh, being given the rights, if they so wanted, to take over uh, businesses if the owner had really deserted it. Now, I'm generally in favour of the idea of workplace democracy, uh, although that's a conversation for another time. I don't fully agree with this specific part of it, but it's, it's kind of too long to kind of get into the weeds of it and stuff. But it's still a very radical idea. There's elements to which it's, you know, very good and stuff, yeah, and obviously... You know, besides that, it clearly gives like workers more control over like the businesses that they work in. So basically within this kind of commune, yeah, there was very, very radical ideas. However, the problem with it is that, you know, it, there's no clear leader. And other than this kind of general kind of like uh, consensus over some of these gen general ideas, there's not a clear agenda of like this is where we're heading to and this is like what we want. So much so that, like, the people uh, who, uh, you know, the, the so-called commonards, as they were called, yeah, couldn't even agree on whether to consolidate things in Paris or whether to try and spread the movement uh, across, like, the rest of France. So while you had other people around, like, different cities and towns of France who also set up communes, uh, communes, I don't know why I can't say it, like, the whole video is about it, whatever. Um, but the point is that, while you had people in major cities who were quite revolutionary and stuff, the rest of the people of France, especially in those times, were, you know, basically peasants. And this is something which Lenin uh, would later note on, yeah, that the peasantry are a reactionary force and that in time of revolution cannot be relied on when it comes to, you know, basically overthrowing like the system because they will basically revert back to kind of like feudal uh, like systems of like patronage and stuff. And so they cannot really be relied on at time of revolution. Also on top of this, yeah, you know, within the movement itself, you had like different people competing for different interests, right? So for instance, you had uh, uh, Blanquet, um, I'm gonna butcher his name, I'm terrible with like French names and stuff, but uh, Blanquet, uh, he was basically a, a very radical uh, uh, socialist, uh, pretty much a like communist, right? And what he basically said is that you know, we don't need to have a kind of broad, like, worker-based, like, you know, popular uprising. Instead, what we need is a committed bunch of revolutionaries, and they will spearhead the revolution. And, you know, it's been criticised by people such as Rosa Luxemburg, uh, you know, in, like, prior decades, yeah, that what Lenin did in uh, Russia was essentially Blanquist. You know, so basically, Blanquet was Lenin before Lenin was Lenin, right, if that makes sense. So... Basically, we see the very same thing happening in uh, uh, the Russian Revolution uh, with Bolsheviks, right? Basically, rather than trying to have this kind of uh, popular upswelling of people, instead, a tiny band of revolutionaries seize the means of, like, you know, state apparatus and stuff and basically take control in and of themselves. On the other hand, you also had people like uh, George uh, Clemenceau. So Clement Show, you know, uh, people who know about World War One will know very clearly about him and stuff. You know, he was like the French Prime Minister during that time. And Clement Show at this point was only 30 years old. However, he was one of the revolutionaries as well, but he was kind of one of the more moderate uh, revolutionaries. And, you know, so he kind of had his own agenda as well, which is obviously very separate from the communists and the anarchists and stuff. So what's noticeable about Clement Show is that 
he, like many Republicans, were very, very militaristic. In fact, throughout the rest of his political uh, you know, career, going all the way, obviously, to being like the, the Prime Minister of France during World War I, uh, he was obsessed with revanchism, which is basically uh, getting back the land of Alsace-Lorraine. And basically, you know, he was very much in favour of continuing the war with Germany until they had finally kicked the Germans out of that territory. So for him, you know, he, he wouldn't have basically stopped with any sort of uh, peace and stuff with the Germans until they had been kicked off of French soil, he would, you know, there, was, there would be no uh, making peace with him. 